Good afternoon, you guys. Thanks to this technical support, I managed to turn the microphone on. Thank you. Uh, good to see you today. I see we have a great crowd because we have two great speakers from Washburn University. We're eager to hear, with, hear uh, from them. I'm Carol Jordan. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters. If you're a visitor today, uh, make sure you check with uh, the Lone Ranger back there in the black mask. And he's our membership chair, Alan, and he'll uh, make sure he has your name if you're interested in joining us. Um, so uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, welcome to those visitors. Now that uh, the library has helped us so much do our hybrid meetings, uh, we're gonna go back to the low tech me uh, doing plain Zoom meetings for the summer. Of course, the library has children's program this summer, so we have had to find other locations. This time, we decided we would just stick to Zoom for three months. Then in September, we will be back with, with our more professional library techie people. So uh, stick with us on Zoom this summer, too. Um, our voter services uh, committee is moving into high gear. They have a lot of events uh, set up for us to help people uh, learn how to register or check their status. Uh, uh, Friday at evening, we're gonna be at NOTO uh, for First Friday. We've made an arrangement to be at Arts Connect every First Friday. So if you're gonna, if it's a nice day and you're gonna be hanging out, uh, come by and check our technique. Okay, and then uh, our new voter services chair, Susan Quinn, who I can't see, uh, has a great article. She's already prepared for the next voter and you should read that. It gives you information about volunteering and getting involved in our voter activities, which is great. Uh, Susan will probably give you a call too if you tell me you're interested. Now, with no further ado, I would like to introduce our um, presenters. Uh, Thomas Prosh is a professor and chair of the Department of History at Washburn University, where he teaches courses in world and European history. He has a PhD from Indiana University, a BA and MA from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, Kara Kendall Morwick is associate professor of English at Washburn. She teaches British and American literature, uh, literary and cultural theory, and she's interested in dogs and cats. Um, a few months ago, we started hearing about CRT. Lots of people didn't know what it was. Um, people who were for it or against it did not appear to know what it was. So we found these two presenters to kind of help us define it and shake aside some of the prejudices and misinformation about it. So uh, I'm gonna let them uh, help us understand CRT. Good afternoon. Um, let me share a screen here. And get this back to the start. Where's yeah, the can we move it? Okay, now we can move it back up there. All right, a uh, quick couple of notes. This has its roots in a forum uh, we did at Washburn, uh, Dr. Kendall Mark and I and a couple of other people. Uh, that time we went on for two hours. So if you want the long version, it's recorded. Um, I can send you a link for it. Uh, just send me an email at tom.prosh at washburn.edu. Uh, today, uh, we'll be doing a much tighter version because I have a class at one. Uh, which, mean, <laughs> which means that I will be ducking out a little early, but Dr. Kendall Morick has promised to stay for all the hard questions at the end. Um, but to get us started, here's a kind of, how do we get this to advance? Okay, it's not advancing. Do you want to? <laughs> okay, where was that? Just click now. I think it was in the Zoom. Okay. 
instead of All right. Uh, this is where the name comes from. Uh, and uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is the person who actually coined the term. Uh, and this first chunk, I'll turn over to Dr. Kendall Moore. So. Thank you very much. And, and thank you all for coming to learn about this um, issue that uh, surprisingly and not surprisingly for me has become um, so controversial and misunderstood of late. Um, I'll just a little uh, background. I, I don't claim to have primary expertise in critical race theory. I'm a literary scholar, but I am a, a big theory nerd, uh, the resident theory nerd of the English department. And so I teach literary um, theory as well as uh, feminist theory and critical race theory, of course, is an important component there. Um, and then recently in my research, I'm really interested in ways that um, concepts of race and gender intersect with concepts of animality. My interest in dogs and cats was mentioned. Um, and so I'm actually on sabbatical this semester and have been able to really dig into a lot of um, critical race theory um, that is newer to me. Um, but Crenshaw, yeah, I think it's important to think about where the name comes from and also what we mean by theory. Um, so theory, I'm going to, you know, give a kind of broad definition is simply a tool that helps us or a framework that helps us understand things, understand why things are the way they are, um, how things work, right? Um, and so when I teach theory, um, I'm kind of thinking about it in those terms. Um, and so we're probably all familiar with the vast body of evidence of racial inequality in our society. I'm not going to dig into each of these slides very much, just give a broad overview of the many, many ways in which we see uh, racial disparities reflected economically in health outcomes and so on, right? So median, and, and I, I should point out too, most of these images show trends over time. And so we can see that not much has changed, and in many ways, things have become worse um, in terms of inequity since the civil rights era, right? Um, so median household wealth, there remains a wide racial gap. This remains wide even when we look at education level, so it's not simply something that can be explained by education level. College graduation rates, we can see uh, a clear racial disparity persisting home ownership, an Im important source of um, intergenerational wealth, poverty rates, health outcomes. There are many examples we could draw from here, but just to take a couple, uh, you know, women, black women, three times more likely to die uh, due to childbirth. We've recently seen, and we've probably heard in the media, uh, disparities in COVID deaths. And not surprisingly, given those health disparities, disparities in longevity. So we're really talking life or death stakes here. And of course, another issue that's received increased attention in recent years, incarceration rates. And you'll notice that these are whole numbers, not proportional. And so black uh, 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 incarcerated people outnumber white, even when they represent, you know, a quarter or less of the population uh, of, of the white population. And then political representation on the left here, you see the actual racial demographics of Congress, where we have three black senators, 52 black representatives. Um, so slightly more uh, uh, closer to uh, reflecting the population there. But if Congress actually reflected the racial makeup of the US population, here's what it would look like, right? We'd have more than four times as many black senators. And all of these unmarked dots are of course white, right? So we see a leadership not reflecting the population. And so critical race theory really fundamentally asks why, right? Why, when we have supposedly achieved political equality uh, in the wake of the civil rights movement, uh, why do these disparities persist and why do they even become worse in some respects? So we'll turn things back to Tom. So let's start with that basic term, critical race theory. And we can think about this as critical theory with race plugged into it. Um, and here, let me start by echoing one of Dr. Kendall Morick's points. When we're talking about theory here, we're using it in a very different way from the way, say, scientists use it. 
uh, we're using it as for cultural th theorists, theory is the apparatus with which you come to any problem. It's a framework for understanding issues. It's not something that it's a hypothesis that you test through method or anything like that. Uh, it's your conceptual apparatus, your framework is theory, right? And critical race theory really is critical theory with race put in and race put in precisely at that point where, as Dr. Kendall Morick was pointing out, the civil rights movement seems to have sort of reached a standstill in terms of actual progress on a range of issues, right? So critical theory first, where do we get that? Critical theory has its roots in the Frankfurt School of uh, the 1930s forward, uh, developed in Germany, uh, kind of key figures, including Herbert Marcuse and Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer, uh, Walter Benjamin to some extent, right? Uh, interestingly, very much framed as response to the rise of Nazism in Germany at that point. Um, also drawing heavily on Marxist thought for their kind of basic critical analysis. Uh, but uh, most of these people flee to, interestingly, the United States as Hitler takes power. Uh, so Marcuse will end up at Berkeley, Adorno uh, and Horkheimer will end up at the New School in New York, right? And so this is when it comes to America. So in response to the rise of Nazism, they sought to understand the deep systems underpinning Nazi power. In a way, they were trying to figure out what happened here? How did this guy take power? And so they start this analysis of culture more broadly as a way to understanding the systems that generated Nazi power, right? This will feed, critical theory will remain a really powerful school in, uh, in thought uh, from the 30s forward. In the 1960s especially, it will feed into new post-structural ideas, probably especially the ideas of Michel Foucault, who in his work kind of re analyzes the way we understand power and power dynamics. Um, and so that kind of gets added in in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, beginning in the late 1970s, critical race theory sought to bring these tools to an understanding of racial issues, initially in relation to U.S. legal theory. It starts and for the most part has remained essentially a legal theory apparatus, right? Um, and looking at the stalled record of civil rights legislation as one of the kind of impelling factors here. So looking for ways to plug race into critical theory and understand the situation in America in the late 90s. 1970s through that. Kind of critical figures here, Derek Bell, I'll get to him a little more in a minute here. Kimberly Crenshaw, she actually coined the term and we saw her on that first slide. Uh, Mari Matsuda, Richard Delgado and others kind of in, in, there at the inception of this movement. So what do we mean by all this? Let's move me out of the way here. Critical key positions of this, uh, of this articulation are first and probably most centrally, race is socially constructed. That is, there is no such thing as biological race. Race is a social construct uh, created through social intercourse and things like that, rather than firmly rooted in any actual biology. Um, and this is a position that's broadly endorsed through the humanities and the social sciences today and by natural scientists as well. Um, race, however, even though it's socially constructed, still shapes our lived experience because, of course, we live in societies. So that race is socially constructed doesn't mean that race doesn't have meaning. Uh, it just has a socially constructed meaning. Right. Uh, racism is systemic in American society. This is a kind of fundamental premise of CRT. That means that it's embedded in systems of power, not just a matter of individual prejudice. Uh, it's embedded in the way that things work more deeply. Uh, and that liberalism uh, and the liberal civil rights movement uh, had failed to address these fundamental systems of power. Um, furthermore, whiteness confers unearned advantages they call privilege, uh, with the result that white people face far fewer barriers to success than their black counterparts. And I think Dr. Kendall Morick's slides demonstrated that pretty clearly. Uh, and finally, it's within this movement, and again, a coinage by Crenshaw, she's really good at 
coining terms, uh, intersectionality, uh, the notion that we really, in order to understand race fully, need to understand how racial discourse and its social construction intersects with others, probably, probably most essentially uh, discourse on gender. You know, So black women are in a particularly disadvantaged position as a result, for example, uh, but also any number of other kind of vectors. So you can make race plug into class systems, whatever else, right? So these are the kind of key positions that were laid out in the early years of critical race theory. And these next few slides, I will warn you, don't even try to read them. They're gonna be really small print. <laughs> I will kind of highlight them, but I wanted to give you some sense of where this all kind of begins. Um, move myself out of the way again. Uh, this is something like a founding document. Uh, and this is uh, Derek Bell's kind of commentary, interestingly, on something that uh, those of us here in Topeka have a real strong grasp of, uh, Brown v. Board, right? Uh, and in this kind of interesting comment on another article in a legal review uh, journal, he kind of lays out this framework for understanding how broad Brown v. Board came to be what he calls a convergence of interests between white liberal kind of politi politics and black civil rights politics that led to that landmark decision, but also how it has failed. Yes, it has outlawed discrimination. Has it fixed it? Has it fixed even discrimination in the schools? Clearly not. Has it fixed anything else in the social order? Clearly not. And so it's simultaneously an attempt to understand this decision, but also to understand its limits uh, and, and kind of a fundamental challenge to essentially liberal civil rights legislation as, an, as, as a strategy, right? So with that as a starting point, uh, critical race theory kind of emerged. Now, so how does a post-structuralist legal theory developed in the 1970s and 80s become today's talking point? This guy did it. Um, and there's a really fascinating piece in The New Yorker, which goes into a lot of detail, um, and in which Christopher Rufo actually, let me move myself more out of the way here, uh, brags about this in, in kind of over terms. He decided to make this an issue, right? And so he kind of constructs and gets the word out and appears on Fox News 147 times, uh, and so on and so on, to kind of create critical race theory, which up until that point, nobody had been talking about outside of the legal academy, really, and outside of humanities and social science discourses that had begun to pick up on some of these ideas. But nobody was talking about it broadly. How it becomes a political issue, this guy made it one, and made it one quite deliberately as one of those wedge issues in political discourse. And the result is a whole series of places where they are passing laws of various kinds that seek to restrict uh, critical race theory. And there's a really good account of this, the Brookings Institute, uh, Rayshon Ray and Alexander Gibbons do a great system of an introductory sort of understanding of this, but then also every single law that has been proposed in any legislature, they've got the text there. So this is an incredibly valuable site if you wanna explore it and just put into your Google search, Brookings Institute, critical race theory, you'll get there. Um, but you know, as we can see, there have been successful bans in a whole series of state legislatures, Idaho, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Iowa, New Hampshire, Arizona, and South Carolina have all already passed bills that in one way or another ban critical race theory. Um, and then there are a whole series of places where they're considering them. That's a long list of states. Um, there is also, uh, at this point, some effort to do this on a federal level, but so far, most of the real impetus here has been state level activism of one kind or another. So what do these bills look like? I think there's several things that we can notice about these bills. And again, you can notice this with me pointing it out rather than trying to read the small print here. Uh, but the two biggest things I would say is, first of all, the premises under which these bills are constructed creates a critical race theory that in fact resembles nothing that critical race theorists say. So uh, for example, number one in this Idaho bill, that any sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin is inherently superior or inferior. That sounds like 
good stuff, right? We don't want to believe that. But let's point out, no one advocating for critical race theory says anything of that sort. No one says that one race, ethnicity, religion, or color is preferable to another or more or, or superior to another. That's not part of critical race theory, right? Um, that individuals should be adversely treated, treated on the basis of their sex, race, ethnicity, religion. Saying that you're against that sounds great, but saying it in an anti-critical race theory bill kind of presumes that they are saying it and they're not, right? So the first thing to notice is that most of the construction of critical race theory in these bills is deliberately false, right? The second thing to notice about these bills and, you know, <laughs> compare them side by side and you see this on uh, 1A in Oklahoma, one ra race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. An individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. The language is practically cutty, uh, cookie cutter. Uh, it is standardized language pretty much everywhere. Uh, if you want the background on that, we can talk about Alex sometime, but this is essentially the same bill passed over and over in multiple legislatures. So Idaho, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, let's Iowa, New Hampshire, and we see over and over again, exactly word for word often the same language cropping up and word for word, the same misrepresentations of what critical race theory is up to. Uh, Arizona, South Carolina, same sort of stuff. Uh, we can take a closer look at one of these bills to really get into the details of it um, and, and see how much of a challenge this is for school systems. Uh, so a teacher, administrator, or other employee of a state agency, school district, or open enrollment charter school may not require or make part of a course the concept that one race or sex is inherently superior to another. CRT doesn't say that anyway. Um, that, that sounds fine so far. An individual by virtue of the individual's race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. That is a an attack on that notion of privilege. Um, uh, three, an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of the individual's race. That's an attack on that whole affirmative action agenda, broadly speaking. Uh, four, members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. That kind of blocks a whole series of historical discussions where this has happened, of course, um, et cetera, right? And, and uh, Probably the most important and most disturbing of these is seven. An individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of the individual's race or sex. This should not happen in the schools. And I would propose, broadly speaking, that if that's going to be taken seriously, you can't teach history. You can't teach anything bad that happened because it's bound to create discomfort if it's done right at all. You certainly can't treat the Holocaust. You certainly can't treat a history of racial oppression because those things are uncomfortable facts, right? But if you can't teach on the basis of what feeling is generated by your teaching, you can't teach. And that brings us back to Kara. Oops. I have to figure out how to back on. <laughs> no worries. There we go. Yeah, and actually, I'm going to go back to your previous slide here because um, I uh, also want to point out the, um, uh, let's see, is it six? Yeah, um, the stipulation that an individual or the banning of teaching of the idea that an individual bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex, which you can see as another attack on that notion of privilege, right, or of unearned advantages. Um, <clears throat> but I want to also take this um, point as, as an opportunity to acknowledge you know, the, the racial demographics of this room, right? If you'll, if you'll permit me, I, I'm seeing a mostly white or at least white presenting audience. We have white speakers, right? And one privilege that I hold um, as a white uh, teacher is being able to talk about these issues without being perceived automatically as having a personal ax to grind, as biased, right? As having an agenda. 
Um, <clears throat> And so on that note of bearing responsibility for actions committed in the past, um, the, a way that I try to sort of frame this uh, or talk with students about this is I might not have committed those acts in the past, right? I'm not responsible in that sense, but I do bear a responsibility for understanding and acknowledging my privilege in the present, right? The unearned advantages I hold as a result of that history, right? Um, that that history in that sense is very much alive in the present. And so I hope in, you know, one way of doing that is a forum um, like this one. I also want to talk about the response from the Department of Education in Kansas. And this is a really common refrain we've heard in responses to attacks on critical race theory, essentially saying, don't worry, we're not doing that, right? Um, and I wanna talk about why that is problematic. So as Tom alluded to, uh, the um, origins of critical race theory are, are very specific to a legal uh, studies context, right? Crenshaw comes from a legal background. Her concept of intersectionality is something she looks at in the uh, sort of legal realm in, in areas like employment opportunities. Um, but critical race theory has expanded, its implications have expanded well beyond that realm to the point that it is a standard component of a class like literary criticism and theory, which I teach at Washburn. Um, and so when sort of the response from departments of education or boards of education, um, you know, school officials and so on is, don't worry, we don't teach critical race theory. That's something that really concerns me as someone who, though not a legal scholar, does see myself as teaching critical race theory. And I hope that it's something that informs everything that I do as a teacher. Um, so you'll see this kind of response. Don't worry, you know, we're not teaching that. Um, it's just something that those legal scholar nerds do. Um, no, nothing to see here. Um, and I think what's really harmful there, if you pair that with what Tom pointed out about those different provisions and the specific attacks they're making, right, is that you concede, you, you essentially um, say, oh, you know, that's not something uh, that we teach, um, that's not so something that is relevant to our students, right? And again, if you look back, especially at this notion of comfort or discomfort, right? Psychological guilt, anguish, et cetera, psychological distress. I think it's important to think about who we're protecting there. Who is being made to feel comfortable, right? Whose feelings, whose psychological comfort are we concerned about? You can't, again, teach topics like slavery. In my case, I don't know how I could teach a novel by Nella Larson or Toni Morrison or poetry by Langston Hughes without addressing race. Um, and without getting into some of these notions of privilege, um, of implicit bias, you know, so on and so forth. And so, although well-meaning people, as I think we can see, can read these provisions and think, yeah, I don't want kids learning that. I don't want that being taught in schools. Um, what this really does, particularly um, that notion of that, that sort of prohibition of causing any kind of psychological distress, is effectively silence any conversation about race. And it also presumes that those whose psychological well-being um, is worth protecting are white students in the room, because we know that students of color have long felt extremely uncomfortable and felt psychological distress uh, from having their histories not taught in the classroom or taught through a white lens. So I want to say a little bit about um, critical race theory in the humanities, which again is my primary um, area. So it's, uh, I really like Purdue University Owl's um, definition of this. I'm also an IU uh, a PhD holder, and so I'm supposed to hate everything Purdue, but they do have a pretty good writing lab online. Um, and they have a good definition there, I think, for thinking about why critical race theory has, you know, expanded well beyond that legal um, context and is useful broadly in the humanities and social sciences. Um, so it's a theoretical and interpretive mode that examines the appearance of race and racism across dominant cultural modes of expression. So in the humanities, we're interested in those modes of expression. We look to literature, film, art, mass media, other forms of cultural expression 
Um, and we look at it um, in that critical race theory lens to understand how race is socially constructed, what the dominant group's perceptions of race are, how members of racial minorities perceive and construct their own identities, how institutionalized and systemic racism are experienced by individuals. And also it's a little obscured here by the um, captions, but how things might be otherwise. So if you look at, for example, a lot of Afrofuturist science fiction, um, there's you know, a fascinating sort of ways that we can use literature to imagine what a different world might look like, right? And that can help expose the assumptions that we hold in our current world. And then I also want to, uh, again, in response to that, no, no, we don't teach critical race theory, nothing to see here kind of um, defense. Um, I want to say that even when we don't teach critical race theory, we should be teaching with it in the humanities. Um, so one of my you know, jobs as a professor of English at Washburn is to prepare future educators. Um, so uh, we have an English education program and our students are going to go on to teach middle and high school English. Um, and they're going to be far more affected by this attack on critical race theory than I am at the college level. Um, and so I teach those students critical race theory, not because I think they're going to go on and assign you know, Bell Hooks and Kimberly Crenshaw and Derek Bell to their students in middle and high school. They probably won't. Um, but because it should be, again, a framework through which they're teaching really just about anything that they teach, particularly in American literature. Um, and so I mentioned earlier, not imagining being able to teach a novel by Toni Morrison without referencing race, without a sort of critical race theory framework. But I think that when students teach white authors, right, whiteness is not a category that should be allowed to remain invisible and unmarked. So when I teach The Great Gatsby, for example, a novel that when you read it through a critical race theory lens turns out to have quite a lot to say about race and the construction of race. Um, that's a framework that's really useful for, for thinking about how that novel participates in and critiques the construction of whiteness. Um, so because racism is an embedded part of US American and other societies, um, in the humanities, we seek to better understand all aspects of society by applying critical race theory. Uh, earlier this year at Washburn, we had the great privilege of um, having a guest speaker, Dr. Amara DeCure, who uh, among many brilliant things she said while she was with us, um, uh, said that critical race theory allows us to explain the persistence of inequities by the persistence of racism and gives us a language to make that explanation visible for our students. Uh, you know, the notion that we're protecting students from knowledge of uh, racism and our uh, racially disparate past and present is pretty laughable, right? They know what's going on. Um, they see the world around them. They see these inequities. We are really doing all students, white, black, uh, students of all backgrounds, a disservice if we're not helping to explain that and make that explanation visible for them. Um, let's see. I'm gonna actually, I don't know if Tom, Tom you gonna pick up here? Yeah. Let's go back to Texas very briefly to add one footnote to what we've said so far. And that is a footnote that you have to get to the bottom of the screen to see. So we'll, I'll be silent for just long enough to let the, the subtitles go away. Oh, I said. <laughs> Another thing being banned routinely is the 1619 project. And you see that actually in that last one, you cannot require a student to understand that. And really, <laughs> you're going to make it a law that students cannot be allowed to understand this? Is that really what we want? Uh, but also, uh, you see it as well. Um, in nine, the advent of slavery in the United States constituted the true founding. That's why they chose that uh, name, 1619. And uh, 10, which kind of concentrates on the notion that slavery is somehow an American value. I, I would say that 
this is where the sort of Southern agenda of anti-critical race theory comes out particularly strongly is in the fact that this assertion that we should not talk about that past uh, and not talk about it in ways that make it seem like that's what America is about. When in fact, for a very long time, it was absolutely what America was about. And even today, to very large extents, as uh, Kara's initial slide showed, it still is. That's a bit of a problem. 